flashes, huh? What's your favorite scary movie? Um, <laughs> not that one. <laughs> um, uh. When you're attempting to do a sequel to a beloved franchise, obstacles will present themselves to you at multiple angles. And if you're doing a sequel to a benchmark horror franchise crafted by the legendary horror wizard Wes Craven, then you better make sure you're on your absolute A-game. Radio Silence started their era with Scream 5. It had some mixed reactions to the OG hardcore fans, but did manage to bring in new fans. Now with a sixth film heading to New York, will the franchise forge ahead or falter? Let's get down to brass tacks. In this Why You Hate video, I'm going to go over reasons why fans have issues with Scream 6, including a mistake that I think was one of the biggest mistakes of the entire franchise. I will also attempt, if possible, to show how those reasons might not hold as much weight as it seems. Here are the reasons why you hate Scream 6. Number one, the opening. The opening of Scream 6 starts with Samara Weaving's Laura Crane. We know what you guys were doing with that name. Why on God's green earth would a 32-year-old films studies professor at Blackmore College who has an interest in teaching her students about slashers and looks like that would have to resort to blind dating? Makes no sense. Seriously though, if she was an expert on slasher movies, even though she admitted that she dislikes the stab films, there would have been little chance that she would have gone into the dark alley of New York City so easily. Medium fail, Scream 6. Medium fail. Now I see something red. The franchise's newly added gimmick, the opening scene reveal, was a shock for fans most certainly, but it also took away the mystery whodunit element that the franchise has always hung its hat on. The bigger issue is the quick death of said Ghostface reveal, Jason Carvey. After playing a fun, thrill-filled game of hot or cold, Jason finds his Ghostface partner, Greg Buckner's dismembered body in the refrigerator, and then he was killed by the real Ghostface, who, as he states, Who gives a fuck about movies? Uh, you do in a way, man. I mean, I don't want to skip forward, but you definitely showed reverence for Richie's hobbies and his collectibles. Anyway, what would have been a cool plot is if Jason had lived longer and got closer and closer to killing Sam and Tara. That would have been a real tension-filled plot reminiscent of what Wes Craven originally wanted to do with Scream 5 where Jill survived and Sydney had amnesia. A ghost face we know of who is stalking, plus trying to hide their identity, would have been fresh. Add that with a killer whose identity isn't revealed, and we got a winner for a story. We didn't get that. We got a gimmick that is cool, but loses so much sheen with multiple rewatches. Number two, characters and their story. The characters were a roller coaster in this film, newly nicknamed the core four were all great in six whereas in scream five mainly sam was the one highlighted it was good to see the four survivors interact with each other in their scenes and to show more reach but this was to the detriment of the new characters annika was mindy's girlfriend and other than her spectacular death scene she was basically just sitting there Quinn also was a blank character pretty much, until the reveal where she crazied up for like 5 minutes. Shame on you Scream 6. Crazy Quinn was actually a highlight. Look at her face and eyes. Look. At. Her. Do you know how easy it was to turn Sam from the hero of Woodsboro into the villain? This is some good crazy right there. Easily the best ghost face of the three hands down. Ethan was a waste of space, a red herring that actually wasn't interesting as a red herring. How could that happen? They gave nothing of worth to Jack Champion to work with. 
why not kill or finish off Mindy after her attack in the subway? I don't know. Why do that? Maybe because you're supposed to be a ghost face killer. And you blew it! You blew it! Crazy. Danny was an okay character. The boyfriend, a red herring, actually the most understanding boyfriend of all time. Yeah. Good job, Danny. Good job. And of course, Wayne Bailey, the leader, the father. Just how did it go this way with an actor of the level of Dermot Moroni? Yeah. Not only was he a prime suspect from the very second he was shown on screen, but he even gave it away multiple times. You fuck with my family. You die. Agreed. Other than quote unquote being on the case, he had nothing memorable to this role and also committed a bigger sin that I'll get to in another section coming up. Number three, legacy characters. Unfortunately to many fans, there was no Sidney Prescott in Scream 6. Nev Campbell made the choice to decline the studio's pay offer as she thought it did not reflect what she brings to the character and to the franchise. I cannot blame her for this at all. Nev Campbell and the character of Sydney are absolutely iconic and a cornerstone of Scream. Her professionalism and talent has brought so much to horror and the stories depicted in the Scream franchise. Other than maybe only Jamie Lee Curtis from the Halloween franchise, there's no bigger long-term and multiple films final girl than Nev Campbell. In a world where we just recently saw Jamie headlining in the David Gordon Green Halloween trilogy, it's a shame that the studio chose to lowball Nev's payday, and I'm looking at you, Gary Barber. And you blew it! You blew it! But Sydney was not the only legacy character that wasn't allowed to shine. Hayden Panettiere returned as a fan favorite. Kirby from Screen 4. Special Agent Kirby Reed, FBI. I work out of the Atlanta office. Mm. Kirby is now working for the FBI and is a self-made Ghostface killer hunter, bent on trying to prevent others falling victim to Ghostface as she did to Charlie and Jill in Screen 4. Kirby is a great character and Hayden was very happy and appreciative to return to the franchise, but unfortunately they didn't give her much to do with her arc. There could have been an interesting direction for Kirby to go into, but didn't. I had thoughts before seeing the film that she would still be haunted from the events of her attack. Maybe a nightmare scene. Maybe there would be scenes where she was having tremors or physical reactions or something that would have added to her character and the history that she endured. Or maybe she starts down the road of becoming a vigilante. Many threads could have been explored, but none were taken and it was unfortunate. I saw that in a scary movie once. <sighs> the last legacy character to address might be the worst depicted in the entirety of the Scream franchise. And that award goes to Gail. Hello. Hello, Gail. Strange that you and I have never spoken on the phone. This is long overdue. Yes, I said Gail. That Gail. Gail Weathers. There is absolutely no reason for her to be in this film. They gave Courtney Cox barely anything to work with. She writes a book about the events in the last film when she said that she wouldn't. Gail explains that her reasoning was, well, someone was going to do it. Unbelievable backtrack for a character that has shown such an interesting arc over the previous films. I get that Gail is best when she is feisty and chasing the case and doing those things. I agree with that and I get it. I really do. But there were tons of ways to do that without her betraying what she said in Scream 5 and essentially betraying the memory of Dewey. Basically, Gail was there to show the crew the shrine and to have a ghost face attack scene. The attack scene was really well done and we got the first ghost face call to Gail, but it could have been any other character instead of her. Number four, the Terminator. Who knew that the legendary Arnold Schwarzenegger would reprise his breakout role of the futuristic killer cyborg? The only problem was 
that Arnold called out during the shooting of Scream 6, and Mason Gooding stepped up to the challenge as Chad. Yeah. Of all the would-be victims of a Ghostface attack, or for that matter, any victim of any attack in any horror movie ever created, Chad has survived what all human beings on this planet would consider to be beyond the impossible. He was stabbed so many times that even the greatest mathematician would not be able to keep count. Worst of all is that Radio Silence acknowledged how this was absolutely ridiculous and transcended the bounds of reality, then admitted that originally Chad was going to be stabbed even more times and still survive. I'm a fan of the Terminator franchise, and I'm happy to see it cross over into Scream. Good job, guys. Good job. Number 5. The Kills You know who is the most angry over the fact that so many characters survived Scream 6? Who would have thought that we would have so many characters survive? Come on, motherfucker! I mean, this was the movie to be in if as an actor you wanted a huge percentage chance to survive and make it into the next sequel. The most ghost face killers of all time and the most survivors. Does that math add up for you? Unbelievably crazy. People had arteries sliced, limbs half cut off, and bones broken in two, and yet these ghost face killers didn't deliver the body count. For fans that point a disapproving finger at Charlie, Amber, Mrs. Loomis, or Richie, guess what? They have all shown to be better at killing than these goons. For the attacks that actually killed someone, most were a carbon copy of going stab happy to the 20th degree, which did show intensity, but left a little creativity to be desired. The Annika kill was by far the best attack death scene in the film. The tension, camera work, and death were executed beautifully. This also is what shows the lack of creativity with the setting for the other kills. There should have been at least one, if not two more scenes that used the city landscape to its advantage. And that's what many fans, including myself, were not only hoping for, but half expected. Number 6. Killer Reveal Scream 6 has probably the weakest and most ridiculously executed reveal of the entire franchise. Richie Kirsch's father, brother, and sister all decide to go on a killing spree in the name of revenge. What? What? Obviously a call back to Mrs. Loomis in Scream 2, but a huge difference is that she is getting revenge because of Sydney's mother and the fallout of the Loomis family after that. It's a motive that makes sense and it is realistic. I mean, hey, your son is killed because he's a psycho, so you go get your younger son to kill your wife and bring your daughter into your three ring killer club. Sounds pretty good to me, makes sense. Ethan is totally unbelievable after the reveal. Again, I'm looking at the Amber and Charlie haters out there. Ethan was mega out ghost faced by Quinn for believability and Wayne Bailey made the weirdest and most uneven jump to lunatic this side of Woodsboro. Because everybody dies, Sam. Everyone who had anything to do with the death of my son suffers and dies. Well, yeah, they do. His delivery was beyond cringe. He was beyond stupid too. I mean, when do you run with a gun in your hand at the person you're looking to kill? This guy does. At the end of the day though, this film has many issues that counterbalance the good choices that were made. It's a recipe for debate among fans. As always, this video is not here to make you love Scream 6. It is just a discussion to highlight different aspects of the film with the fans. But what do you think? Are you a fan of Scream 6? If so, tell us why. If not, Let's discuss why you hate Scream 6. If you haven't liked this video yet, please do. I'd appreciate it if you're not subscribed to the Nightwatch Zone. This is the time to do it, do it, and become part of this fantastic community where you'll never love and talk about movies the same. If you like this video, check out my other Why You Hate videos or other content here, and I'll see you there. If you're watching this, 
if you're listening to this, you are the Night Watch. Peace. Thank you.